Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth of Tishrei. Um, and um, that means we are five days in to the 10 days of awe, to the 10 days of tshuva. We are at the halfway point. And it also means we are five days to Yom Kippur. So um, it's a good time to just sort of take stock. Um, and it happens to be my Hebrew birthday today. So, um, and my 50th. So all, all, all true in all ways for me on the calendar. So thank you for celebrating with me by studying some Torah. Um, before we get into our texts for today, just want to remember um, that all that we're doing right now um, in terms of learning and spiritual practice is based in an understanding in the Jewish tradition that we are living, ever-changing, dynamic creatures. And that's why we can do tshuva, this return work. And so let's remind ourselves not only um, cognitively, but also through the song that we sing um, every day um, of these 10 days that says, remember us to life. Zohreinu lechaim Melech hafetz b'chaim Lechot beinu v'sefer chaim Lemanecha Elohim Chaim. And thank you for all of the generous, enthusiastic birthday wishes. So before we get into our hero, our master of tshuva today, I wanted to just check in with anyone's experiences at this point of either Ta'anit Dibor, our first spiritual practice um, of limiting speech, or yesterday's practice of actually saying something, Psalm 130. Um, and by the way, for our new members, uh, new joiners today, um, every day we are, are looking at one of five heroes or masters of repentance or return. And we're looking at a text about how to do return or what it means to do tshuva work and also suggesting a spiritual practice for the day. So our first two spiritual practices were limiting speech and yesterday's was saying Psalm 130. And um, I'm just curious if anybody has any reflections or questions about um, these practices, especially Psalm 130. So I'm going to leave the chat open for a moment um, in case people want to ask or say something. And while that's happening, I will just direct your attention that in today's source sheet, um, at the end of it, I actually posted a link to an Israeli group's um, musical rendition of Psalm 130. For, so, for those of you who want to keep exploring Psalm 130 or even having it be a part of your day during these 10 days, you can actually do it with some musical accompaniment or you can dance to it. Um, okay, and I see first practice saying less, I find is creating more space for myself. Beautiful, beautiful, wonderful. All right. So feel free to continue to add reflections or thoughts, um, but we're going to get into our new master of tshuva today, which I, I just found fascinating. I, I just felt like I could do a lot more learning on, uh, on this person and, and why he was selected as a master of tshuva. But um, again, um, for our new folks, um, Pirkei to Rebbe Eliezer is the collection of Midrashim, where all five of these masters of tshuva are listed one after another. 
each with the introductory statement, Tedalecha koach tshuva, know the power of tshuva, of repentance, right? So each one is letting us know, um, each person is a model for us. And then it says, bo ure'e, come and see, right? Don't just know it, but see how it happens. And today, da -da -da, drum roll, today our master of tshuva is none other than Manasha, who was um, the son of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of the best loved and known uh, for being a righteous king. Um, and then his son, Manasha, was known for being among the worst. He took all that Hezekiah had done and he brought everyone to idol worship. And before we get too judgmental of Manasha, because it's not, it's, it's, it's the opposite of what we're trying to do on these 10 days. We're not trying to be judgmental of anyone else, right? We, our, 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 our examination is solely on ourselves. Everyone else has their own work. And Manasha became king at the tender age of 12. So maybe we can cut him some slack too, as does the Midrash eventually. In the beginning, you're gonna see Manasha, son of Hezekiah, who perpetrated all the evil abominations much more than all the nations. He, he found ways to, um, to worship other gods that the other nations didn't even see. He made his son to pass through the fire to Baal outside of Jerusalem, causing doves to fly and sacrificing to all the host of heaven. The princes of the troops of the king of Babylon came and they caught him by the hair of his head and brought him down to Babylon, and they put him in a pan over a fire. Okay, and so let me just explain all of this just for a second. He was king around the same time of Isaiah. Um, in, some, uh, in some understanding, Isaiah was actually his maternal grandfather, and he even uh, tried to kill Isaiah. Um, but Isaiah prophesied um, the end of his realm and that the um, Babylonians would come and capture him. And this came to be true. And so when he was captured, and in this Midrash, he's being held over a fire. In that moment of truth, he called upon all the other gods to whom he had sacrificed, and not one of them either answered him or saved him. And then he said, I will call on the God of my ancestors with all my heart. Perhaps God will do unto me according to all their wonders which they did unto my father, Hezekiah. And he called on the God of his ancestors with all of his heart, and God was entreated of him, and God heard his supplication, as it is said, and he prayed unto Adonai, and he entreated of them, and heard his supplication. Then Manasha knew that Adonai was God. In that hour, Manasha said, there is both judgment as well as a judge. And that sounds like in Aramaic, you can see it in the end of the Hebrew text, eat din ve'it dayan. There is judgment and a judge. Okay, so why this guy? Right, that's our question when we get each of our, our masters of tshuva. Why someone who did such evil and like yesterday and like the day before, all, all three of our heroes or masters of Chuva so far have been kings. 
all people of incredible power. And I think it's a real question, right? Um, why do we have kings each day thus far? And then also a real question, this one in particular seems to be problematic because he tries everything else first. He even tries other gods first, right? And if anyone's tshuva is going to be suspect, it's going to be a guy who has lost everything, is literally a prisoner being held over a fire. What kind of real tshuva is that? Isn't he just trying to save his skin? And my guess is that's actually the point. It's actually the point to say which the liturgy of the High Holidays tells us over and over again that God, exactly what Judah just put in the chat, God is always waiting for us, is not a jealous God, and is forgiving. God is actually on Team Chuba. God is waiting for us to make any tiny move, and then we will be helped. God wants this to happen. God's not waiting saying, well, I don't know if that's real Chuba. God's going to take any opening, right? And that's what we saw in our, our first day um, when we were talking about the lights of Chuva that exist right now. Somebody saw in the chat, why can't we do Chuva every day, all year long, 365, right? And we do. There's a, there's a blessing in the daily Amidah and the three times a day prayer that the rabbi set up to say, Every single day, Rotseb Tshuva, God is the one who wants Tshuva, wants repentance, wants return to our true selves. So we do do it every day. But this time of the year, these 10 days are the time when in the spiritual universe, there is just extra power to help us do it. This is concentrated time so that we can enter Yom Kippur, and we'll talk about this tomorrow and confess out loud with words everything we need to say. Okay. So interestingly enough, in that vein, there is a prayer of King Manasseh. There is um, in the Apocrypha, and the Apocrypha are extra biblical texts, I should say extra biblical texts to the Hebrew Bible, right? To the Jewish collection that is the Torah or the Tanakh, we do not recognize or include the prayer of Menashe in our biblical texts, okay? It is not an authoritative Jewish text. Honestly, in preparing, I had never seen or heard of it before in all of my learning. But I was fascinated to find it because someone thought to say, huh, when Manasseh was over the fire and in this moment, what did he cry out to God? What was the text of that prayer? And it was so convincing that it actually made it in to other, um, to other um, collections. So for example, um, it made it into the collection that is Vulgate and Martin Luther included the prayer in his 74 book translation of the Bible into German. It also made it into the 1537 Matthew Bible, the 1599 Geneva Bible, and I'm including it um, on your text sheet from the Apocrypha of the King James translation. So it's actually in there, right? Um, and so I thought that it was interesting to include for today, I'm not going to go through it just because of our time, 
But I do want to just point out that in the Midrash, what it says, and he prayed to God, right? Um, he called before that, um, two lines up from where it's bolded, and he, Menashe, called on the God of his ancestors with all his heart. I just want to remember that we're going to come back to that. He called on the God of his ancestors with all his heart. There are three important things I want to sort of parse out from this line. One, he called out. He didn't think it. He didn't write about it. With his voice and his words, he articulated a call. And he called specifically to the God of his ancestors in the actual prayer. We can see that they begin the prayer, O Lord, almighty God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of their righteous seed, right? So this idea that, that it's connected somehow to the tradition, and to the ancestors. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly for our purposes, he also calls out with all his heart. And this is the text's nod to what I, nor what I started out with by saying, ugh, maybe he didn't really mean it. Maybe, you know, he was gaming the system. He tried all the other gods, so now he's trying this god. And the text says, no, this is not the Apocrypha. This is our Midrash. The Midrash is saying, he called out to the god of the ancestors with all of his heart. Even if it was just for a minute, even if it wasn't sustainable, for that moment, his whole heart, his whole being, his whole spirit, was engaged in calling out to the God of his ancestors. And that is a moment of tshuva. If all of you is oriented to the source, then you have returned to the source, even just for that moment. And I think that is why he is a master of tshuva. Any questions or thoughts? I'll take a moment before we go into our tshuva text. Okay, so our tshuva text for today, I thought I was going to give us, um, Chronicles is a Jewish text, yes, it is, uh, we have two books of Chronicles, um, we call them Divrei Yamim, um, Aleph and Bet, one and two, um, so that is part of our um, text. Okay. Um, I had thought that I was going to use a different teacher for a tshuva text every day, but Rav Cook is just so great, and his lights of tshuva were just so um, inspiring that I'm gonna, I, I might have a new one tomorrow, but I, I wanted to use his today, um, especially because I thought that it went really, really, really well, um, really, really, really well with um, this text. So you can see on your sheets on the bottom of page two from Rev Cook's The Lights of Return. When one forgets the essence of one's soul, when one distracts their mind from attending to the substantive content of their own inner life, everything becomes confused and uncertain. When you are not acting from the truth of your soul, but from the influence or the echoes of others, you've lost your way. And you can only move forward in uncertainty and confusion. One way of saying this is when the headlines take over your life or social media instead of your own soul, then how can you move forward with clarity and confidence? Everything becomes confusion and uncertainty. The primary role of tshuva, of return, the primary role of 
tshuva, which at once sheds light on the darkened zone, is for the person simply to return to themselves, to the root of their soul. Once you know your own thoughts, your own needs, your own call, right? Once you can connect into that, then you return at once to God, to the soul of all souls. It just happens. Then they will progress continually, higher and higher, in holiness and in purity. This is true whether we consider the individual, a whole people, or the whole of humanity, or whether we consider the mending of all existence, which always becomes damaged when it forgets itself. This is just such an amazing text to me. It says A, which is to me such a text for this moment. When you just pay attention to all that is whirling and swirling around you, you will not find the way forward. The way forward is when you return to the truth of your own soul, which no one can write up for you in an op-ed, which no one can offer you, can only be accessed by yourself. And then he says in the end, and again, I'd love to spend more time on this, this also applies to communities, to groups, to nations who forget their identity and who make decisions that are not based on what their founding values are. I think there's a lot in this text, but mainly for our purposes of practice, I'm going to suggest we focus just on this idea, which I think he's giving us that tshuva literally is return. And what we're trying to do is just hear that voice of our own soul. And so I'm actually going to give you two possibilities for today's, um, today's spiritual practice. And they're both linked to ones that we have done before in different ways. One is if it's easiest for you to hear yourself in quiet or in silence, if, you, if meditation is a practice for you, then I'd suggest that. But for those of you who do not have an established meditation practice, or even if you do, I'd love to suggest something new. And that's the word that's on your sheet, heat bodhidut. Some of you have been practicing this, um, I know. But this is what, um, Manasha did. He called out and he spoke one-on-one -on -one out loud to God with his whole heart. And this is a practice that um, Rebbe Nachman, uh, the famous Hasidic rabbi, recommended for all of his disciples. And these are the elements of it. One, you talk to God in your own language, your own words, your own native language. Two, he suggested you talk to God like God is your best friend. Three, if it's possible, you do it outside, right? And this is the, this is the most important piece. It's out loud. You may think, oh, just thinking it is the same as speaking it. But anyone who's tried this will tell you it's absolutely not. It's a very different experience. And so I'm going to suggest you could do it literally just for five minutes. Just try to open up a conversation with the Holy One. And my suggestion is, and I'll put this, I can put this in the chat, is actually just start out saying something like, Hineni, which is what all the ancestors say when they speak to God. Hineni, which means... Here I am, Hineni, here I am. And then you can just, you can go wherever you go with it. Here I am, I don't know what to say to you. Here I am, somebody suggested I do this, so I'm going to try it. Here I am, I don't remember when the last time I spoke to you was. Here I am, 
I'm trying to return. I'm trying to hear my own voice. Here I am, I'm feeling the confusion and the uncertainty. Here I am, right? And then you can just end with thank you. Thank you for this time together, thank you, right? And just see what happens, right? It's an experiment. You can love it, you can hate it, doesn't matter, right? It's just something to try. That's what spiritual practice um, in the beginning always is. It's throwing something out and noticing what happens. But as an intention, as a practice, we're moving away from stopping talking and just listening to saying specific words from the tradition yesterday, Psalm 130, to now trying to say our own prayer, our own words, whatever they look like that is true for us without having to use anything fancy, just the trying to hear the truth of our own experience with, um, with our own truth for now. So if there are any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, I know for some of you, this might be a very um, new idea, or for some of you, maybe this is something that, that you've done. Um, many times. Um, but I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, but I, since we have a moment left, I want to do our normal thing of closing um, our learning. Uh, the, the translation of heat boat dude is a great question. Thank you. Um, Boded means to be alone. Um, right now in Israel, if you go into Israel, you have to be in be dude uh, quarantine for two weeks, right? So it's from that, so it's, but it's self-reflexive. So it's making yourself, being alone with yourself, returning to yourself, intentionally being just with yourself, right? And by the way, that's the idea of what speaking to God is, right? Okay, so um, we're in our last minute. If anyone wants to put a word in the chat, as something they experienced this morning or a wish for the new year, um, that let's make a prayer together out of, um, so just go ahead and start tapping in the chat. I'm gonna put my own word and from that we will make a prayer out of our learning today. I see hope, sanity, health, healing, resilience, love, Gratitude, peace, community, patience, unconditional love, seeking, fulfillment. God helps us to measure our words, rejuvenate. All these good things. I saw a lot more kindness, justice, right? There is a judge and there is justice in the world. What a prayer that is for us. Open to listening. May it be so, amen, amen, amen. Thank you for your learning and for your practice.